Okay, so Stephen, thank you once again for uh, taking the time to talk to me and the students at Waterloo and the other people who might watch this video. Uh, you have a number of roles. You're a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution. You manage your own entrepreneurship consultancy and you're a successful entrepreneur yourself. Uh, and in addition to all that, uh, you were the senior advisor for entrepreneurship under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. So uh, you've been described as both a thinker and a pragmatist. Uh, how would you describe what you do? Well, first of all, let me thank you for um, for uh, having me having me on. Um, uh, I I would say that I describe myself primarily as an advocate, um, which is one of the reasons I'm so glad you uh, are talking to me because I seek out as many avenues as possible to advocate for this major idea that I believe is is far too little discussed and far too little uh, acted upon, probably even more importantly, and that is the power of entrepreneurship in so many ways, including in a foreign policy uh, context. Very important. And we're going to have an opportunity this morning, hopefully, to talk very fully about that. So uh, the really the, 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 the first thing I'd like to do is just to establish that uh, you believe that government entrepreneurial policy is very important. You've advised on that. You think it's important in both economic and social development. Why do you think it's so important today? Well, um, as, as, as you know, um, you know, I've, I've just recently finished this book um, uh, on a, a piece through entrepreneurship. And um, I make the argument um, in that book that, um, uh, first of all, there's a chapter in there called A Million Reasons Why Entrepreneurship is Good for You. I, I actually have a baker's dozen, which is 13. Um, but um, some of the key reasons, by far the, the first most important for sure, is job creation. Um, and I believe that, um, that most of the uh, m most significant security threats in the world, uh, terrorism, failed states, the anarchy and the chaos that comes from that, and you can look at examples of that in many places all over the world, the biggest correlate uh, to that violence is joblessness, particularly among young people. And um, it just so happens that uh, uh, joblessness is, is one of those, those few big issues in life that is at least somewhat amenable to mitigating. Um, entrepreneurship is, is a proven creator of jobs in every country, developed and developing. And so and and not only that, but but entrepreneurship levels themselves are influenceable. There are things that can be done now. One of the most important. So from a government standpoint, you know, the responsibility of most governments, first and foremost, is security. Um, and uh, so that would mean that the government definitely should be interested in this just on that basis alone, if, if none other. Um, uh, the, the other the other issue, though, is that um, there are a lot of things in 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 improving the entrepreneurial ecosystem that actually um, require uh, government involvement, not just where it's nice to have, but it's a must have. And the notion that entrepreneurship is by definition, you know, a private sector activity and therefore there's no real role for government really misses um, the, the, the 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 fact um, which is that uh, successful entrepreneurial ecosystems, wherever they are, including, by the way, in Waterloo, Canada, are um, almost always the result, and in fact, in my research, always the result of collaboration between government authorities and the private sector. Um, in the case of, you know, Canada and Waterloo, which is such a famous success story, it's, you know, the town, it's the region, it's the province, it's the federal government and it's private industry. Um, and the same is true, even even more so in developing countries, um, 
And there, foreign governments that have much more experience with successful entrepreneurship development, like the Canadian government and the U.S. government, they have a particularly important role to play. So I, I actually think that while for some it's counterintuitive that government should be involved, for me it's, it's, it's actually the opposite. It's essential. Absolutely, and uh, a very important argument. So, you're, uh, so the role that a government should play, uh, what do you think are the main elements of that? What are the main things that a nation should include in its efforts uh, to enable a strong entrepreneurial element uh, inside their economy. At the same time, uh, I know you've written about the uh, nature of slow-moving, risk-averse government uh, uh, behavior. Uh, so how do you put the two together? What are the main things that you think need to be done? And how do you overcome this uh, risk-averse government behavior? Well, the, the, you, you've put your finger on, you know, one of the key conundrums in this whole um, conversation. Uh, th there are obviously many points of view. My own point of view is, number one, that um, uh, there are certain tasks in society that only government can perform. It's, it's what I call the Star Trek principle, to boldly go where no man has gone before. So there are things that only governments can do. And obviously that starts with the regulatory environment. Um, but it also includes other things like the marshalling of capital for certain um, projects that the private sector would never in a million years fund, um, very often because they are things that set the stage for future economic activity but are not themselves profitable. Think of the Marshall Plan after the Second World War. Uh, you know, the, the, the U.S. and its allies spent billions and billions of dollars rehabilitating Germany and other war-torn countries. Um, and uh, what they have, have ga garnered from that is it's it, incalculable, incalculable, uh, many-fold financial return. Think of all the trade and all of the economic growth that happened. Now, if that original um, investment had not been made, uh, it, it, you know, Western Europe might look a lot more like what Eastern Europe looked like, which did not have the benefit of that. So um, there is a key role for government in doing the things that the private sector cannot do and that require huge amounts of capital. Having said that, the point that you make about um, the government being inefficient is absolutely true. And my answer to that is to not throw up one's hands and say, well, that's just how it is, so forget it. It is to try to solve the problem. And particularly in sophisticated, wealthy, industrialized countries like Canada and the United States, um, we have to uh, face head on uh, the, 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 the inefficiencies of our own bureaucracies and, be, uh, and try to solve them. Uh, I take the approach that an entrepreneur takes, which is, you know, if you have a problem, fix it. Don't avoid it, fix it. Um, and so um, I think that uh, while it is absolutely frustrating, and my book, as you rightly say, is filled with my frustration, and in many cases, anger around this, I fundamentally believe that it still has to happen, and it can happen, and we have to work at it. Your book was published just recently. I've, I've got a copy myself. I think it's a great book. Um, uh, but Peace Through Entrepreneurship is the title, just to remind people. But it talks about encouraging uh, a startup culture uh, and the role that that can play in encouraging greater security and development. Uh, why is the startup culture's in, in, culture important and how can that be created? You know, of all of the things that I think are necessary in the ecosystem, and I, I have this six plus six model that I describe in the book where I talk about six categories of activity and six categories of player that must be involved in developing an ecosystem. I actually think that the single most important is the culture. And when you look around the world, and I don't just mean in developing countries where I spend most of my time, but even in the underdeveloped regions of developed countries or the, the uh, sort of the depressed regions of developed countries, 
the same um, principle applies. If people do not have a culture of entrepreneurship where they are emboldened to try to start a business um, and instead they throw up their hands and leave or simply uh, don't work, um, then you have a, a vicious cycle. And so changing that culture is, is key. And again, it just so happens that there are things that one can do that actually do change culture. For example, um, in the work that I do around the world, one of the programs I, I, I do is something I call entrepreneurship journalism training, where I bring journalists from both the digital and the print world um, in the U.S. or in other countries, other countries that have, have strong uh, entrepreneurship journalism uh, uh, industries, to a country to train local business and economics writers how to better cover up, how to better cover their own startups. Because what I found is that talking to people about Mark Zuckerberg or Larry Page, when you're in, you know, Ghana or in Indonesia or in, in Algeria, is not at all relatable. But if you talk to them about the local entrepreneurs who they don't know exist, but actually, despite all the adversity in the local market, have succeeded nevertheless. Those are the stories that carry a lot of weight, and that starts to change the culture. And that's one example of how one can do it and why it's so important to do. Wonderful. And you mentioned uh, your six by six model and uh, that this was these are the main elements, I guess, of your effective uh, ecosystem that you argue is necessary. Uh, would you be able to describe what those, what that model more fully, I guess, and the, the different elements to it? Sure. So it's it's basically um, uh, it, it has six categories of activity and six categories of participants that have to be involved in knitting together um, uh, a series of programs. Um, the six categories of activity are identify, train, connect, and sustain, fund, enable public policy, and celebrate entrepreneurs. And the six categories of players are corporations, foundations, universities, NGOs, investors, and government. And so um, what, what I believe has to happen and what I do in the, the consulting work that I do is a three-step process. It's a diagnostic of an ecosystem first, then the design of a program based on this six plus six model that fills in the gaps that the diagnostic has demonstrated exist in that particular ecosystem. And then the third step is the implementation of that design. So, um, uh, the, the example that I just talked about, the uh, entrepreneurship journalism training, that's a one small example of a program that in that case is you, you touches on several of the pillars, um, identifying entrepreneurs, right? The journalists find them, celebrating entrepreneurs, the journalists are writing about them. Um, and it includes um, usually more than one of the parties involved because those entrepreneurs, generally speaking, either have a connection to a university or an incubator or some sort of social networking group, um, usually. Um, and very often, there are, as I said, multiple uh, connections that they may have. Um, so um, that's one example of, of a program that, you, that comes out of the six plus six paradigm but that is actually a concrete final expression. And there are several dozen examples like that. So you, you work to implement, uh, I noticed on your website, your approach to some degree in Ghana, and I know you're working in the Caribbean now, uh, and you're working elsewhere, I expect, too. Um, could you describe a little bit about the advice you give a government on how they can... Uh, better uh, encourage entrepreneurship inside their country? You know, what, what's, what sort of approach should Ghana adopt, for example? Well, um, the first thing, which is um, a, a key uh, a, a kind of unspoken part of your question is there has to be someone in the government to talk to who cares about this. So my first lesson that I've learned from having done this now for seven or eight years in three dozen countries is if there isn't a champion in the government, 
you probably are not going to be successful and you should move on to the next country. So if there isn't already at least someone in government, and this goes, by the way, um, not just at the national level, but at whatever level you're working. So, for example, if you're working in at the provincial level in Canada, um, it needs to be at the provincial level. If you're working at the local regional level, uh, you know, in sort of the, the Waterloo area, then it has to be at that level. So there has to be someone to talk to. That's step one. Step two is that this diagnostic that I mentioned is, is specifically designed to um, shed light on the gaps and on the problems in an ecosystem. And I have never worked anywhere where some of those gaps do not require government involvement to fix them. In fact, in most cases, government involvement is the single most important thing required to fix them. So the recommendations will be different based on the geography and based on what is needed in that particular ecosystem. But almost always, um, at least some, if not most of them, need to be presented to that government champion. And that has been my experience everywhere, including in Ghana, where, by the way, um, at least at the time I, I was working there, which is now almost three years ago, um, there were such champions in both the federal government and the state governments and the municipal government. And so um, there was someone to talk to, which is one of the reasons why Ghana actually has one of the uh, most uh, uh, positive or favorable uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems, certainly in West Africa, if not in all of Africa. Very important. So you, you need a champion, a senior level government person who is uh, who has the willingness and power to do the things that you need to be able to uh, to implement the changes. Uh, so we've also seen that Technology entrepreneurs uh, receive a lot of the attention when we talk about entrepreneurship today. Uh, to what extent do you think technology entrepreneurs are important inside developing countries where uh, so far the internet may be connections may be weaker, uh, likely to become stronger in the future, mobile maybe is more important. Um, so, so what role does that play in terms of development today? Well, one of the most important things that I have found in my work is that there are actually three different kinds of entrepreneurship, what I call no tech, low tech and high tech. And it is a great mistake to think that um, any one of those is the silver bullet that solves the unemployment problem. So it is a great mistake to focus, for example, only on high tech entrepreneurship. Every place I've ever been in the world um, uh, fashions themselves to be the next Silicon Valley, uh, without exception. I, it can even be a place that has uh, that has no university. Um, <laughs> so I, I tell people that is really um, not necessarily the right goal. Uh, to be aiming for, um, not only because you're very unlikely to achieve it, and most parts of the United States have been unable to achieve it, um, so uh, all the more so in other countries, but also that it, it actually di diverts your attention from what's really important, which is often job creation. So the fact of the matter is that no tech and low tech um, startups often create many more jobs than high-tech startups. Um, more people work for Starbucks in Santa Clara County, California, than work for Google worldwide. And by the way, um, Starbucks is what I would call a no-tech entrepreneurial business. Starbucks didn't invent coffee. They, they changed the process. So my definition of an entrepreneur is somebody who innovates a product or process and has the ability to make it happen. And when you look at a, a, a whole, uh, at, at all of the successful um, sort of quote unquote startups, um, you will find a very substantial number that are in this no tech or low tech category. Low tech to me 
are companies that use existing technology. So the breakthrough is not in technology, it is in the application of the technology, Uber being the best example of that. Um, or, but many others, eBay is also an example. You know, eBay didn't invent auctions, Uber didn't invent taxis. Um, but they, they brought um, a fairly, what at the time was um, well-known technology solution. In other words, there was no unique intellectual property or there is no unique intellectual property in Uber's use of technology. What they're doing is fairly straightforward um, from a technology standpoint. That's not to say that as it scales, it's not complicated and that the, 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 the stress demands of huge number of users don't have their own technical problems. Of course they do, but it's not that, you know, they invented a cure for cancer. Um, they applied a technology to an existing business. So it's very important to look at all three, no tech, low tech, and high tech. And similarly, the kinds of ecosystem changes that are required to support no tech and low tech entrepreneurs are different than high tech. Um, you, it's not always about, you know, starting an incubator with a bunch of cubicles and high bandwidth and everybody sitting there with headphones on coding. You know, that's not how you're going to start Starbucks. So it's important to recognize that, um, uh, you know, our v vision of what entrepreneurship is, especially in the industrialized world, has been so closely connected to technology. That's not always true uh, in the developing world. Wonderful. Thank you. And, uh, and with this theme in mind, uh, globalization is something that is, Certainly a current political issue. There's a lot of debate about appropriate policies and so forth. Uh, and we're seeing all sorts of uh, discussions there. But uh, it's also uh, changing and uh, creating closer global, global business relationships. Uh, how might this impact entrepreneurs in developing countries? What, what impact might this have? Uh, what are the consequences here? Well, you know, I think that's a really interesting question. And to be honest with you, um, Peter, it's one of the questions that I um, want to think about more um, because uh, you're raising um, sort of a, a, a topic that I haven't worked on as much. I do know that um, uh, there are very, very few um, businesses or ideas um, that are confined by national borders anymore. And, um, in fact, I, it's hard for me to think of any. Um, if, I'll give you an example. There's a company that I worked with in Indonesia called Gojek, which is a, um, a, 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 a basically Uber for motorcycles in big crowded cities like Jakarta. Um, and this is a company that we uh, met when I was running the Global Entrepreneurship Program at the State Department, and we had a delegation of entrepreneurs and investors who went to Indonesia, and we met this company probably four or five years ago. They were looking to raise $250,000 for their business. Um, last month, uh, a Chinese, a major Chinese company invested $550 million in the company on a $1.2 billion valuation. Now, this company provides motorcycle, courier, and taxi services in Jakarta. One would think that is very local and not global. But in point of fact, every major city in every developing country, and in fact, in some developed countries like New York City, has horrendous traffic problems. And solving those problems with motorcycles and scooters and bicycles instead of cars turns out to be a very practical solution. So, you know, you can think of 20 other cities that this um, uh, company could expand to, which obviously is what the investor in China, who which has many, many large, highly congested cities, was thinking about. So this is an example of globalization I especially like this example because it's what I call south to north or south to south. We always think that we in the developed world have the technology that someone else will 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 develop um, and use. And sometimes the answer goes from south to north or south to south. Um, and and it obviously is an example of globalization. So I think it's it's a key 
topic within this broad issue. Yeah, I think it's interesting to consider the role that uh, South to North might have as internet connections improve and uh, capabilities around technology improve in developing countries. One of the things we've been looking at here has been the role NGOs uh, may play uh, in uh, supporting entrepreneurship and, and with that, the facilitation that might take place in the uh, internationalization of relationships around particularly tech startups, I have to admit, um, but also, of course, that might apply in other areas. Uh, your uh, one question I was keen to ask you, uh, I don't know if you have views in this area, uh, but was basically uh, if you have any advice for the Canadian government on entrepreneurship, if they were to ask you what should they do, would you have anything you could help them with? Well, um, my interactions in Canada, um, which which have recently um, deepened, and, and I've spent some time in the you know Toronto and Waterloo um, ecosystems, have left me um, a absolutely uh, uh, astounded at the level of progress and the level of sophistication. And so, I actually think that. Um, the most important thing the Canadians could do is persuade the Americans to do what the Canadians are doing. <laughs> because I think that um, the Canadians are actually far ahead. And I will say um, this is particularly true internationally. Um, the Canadian Development Agency is far more active than USAID um, or any other U.S. government agency in promoting and funding and supporting entrepreneurship growth abroad. Uh, the project I just worked on in the Caribbean was a great example. It was funded by the Canadian government through the World Bank. And um, when we, w w one big part of the project, th this particular one that I just finished was, was mentoring business incubator managers in 10 Caribbean countries. And part of the project included a study tour where we brought them to uh, the Toronto Waterloo region and um, we, we not only showed them a variety of different kinds of, of incubators, no tech, low tech and high tech, uh, but and including, by the way, importantly, social uh, entrepreneurship incubators. But um, that region, as you know better than I, also has a very large Caribbean diaspora. And so um, one of the key things that I think the U.S. government doesn't understand and that the Canadian government has figured out is that the diaspora populations in both of our countries, in both the US and Canada, are made of immigrants. Those diaspora populations are a unique connection to um, these developing countries, and the diaspora members in Canada or in the United States are a unique bridge population to help turbocharge their home countries using what they've learned in Canada or the U.S. and the relationships they have. And I think the Canadians are, are unfortunately, for me, fortunately for you, um, much, much better at understanding this. And I just wish, uh, I would love to, to write uh, some case studies about Canadian examples and, and try and circulate those around town here in Washington more, because I think we, frankly, have more to learn from Canada than the other way around. A very kind uh, endorsement, I guess, of, of, of things Canadian. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, and we have been working in this area at Waterloo. We are, as part of some of the work that I do, uh, we have students from uh, many countries working on projects with NGOs that are going back into those countries in one way or another. Uh, one area we looked at closely recently was the use of technology uh, inside Pakistani schools um, in order to develop the education system there to expand education in rural areas, which of course is you know particularly politically important today. Uh, so uh, so it's very interesting to hear what you've got to say. It's something that uh, an area that we're uh, quite active in, I think, at the moment. Um, so my final question was that is uh, which I like to ask a version of this to everyone I interview because a lot of the people who will watch the interview will be people who are at the beginning of their careers and so 
Uh, so I'm keen to get advice from people that will help them as they think about uh, how they're going to move forward. So, uh, so I'm keen to know uh, what you would say to people who are uh, looking at becoming entrepreneurs in one way or another. Uh, any lessons that you would like to leave them with? Well, I, 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 I mentor um, uh, a lot of, of, of entrepreneurs and, the, the, and, and by the way, I, of all the things that are important to being a successful entrepreneur, I think the most important is mentorship, is finding uh, usually not even just one mentor. Uh, but a couple of mentors, because it's unlikely that one person, no matter who they are or how talented they are, is going to be able to address all the issues that come up. Being an entrepreneur is just about the hardest thing in the world you can do. So the first thing I tell people is be really sure you want to do that, because this is the hardest thing you can ever do. It is much easier to get a job somewhere. Um, so uh, that's the first thing I say is be introspective and make sure you know what you're doing. If you really believe that it's, it's in your gut and you just have to do this, it's a passion and you, you, you think about it and you have to do it, which is the first ingredient, then the, the, to me the next uh, thing is uh, tenacity. Um, you, you, I don't know a single entrepreneur, including myself, um, who doesn't fail more than they succeed. Uh, I, that's certainly true of me. I'm an expert at failing. And um, I think you have to go into this recognizing that's what's going to happen, recognizing that it's a game of odds. You know, how many times are you at bat? Every time you fail makes you that much closer to the success that you may enjoy. And so you need to... Um, uh, learn to embrace those, recognize them, obviously close the door on the failures quickly. This, this notion that venture capitalists have of, you know, shoot your young. Um, but you, you, you need to, to, to be able to have the tenacity to persevere through these failures. And, and so that's the main thing I tell um, people who really want to try and be entrepreneurs on their own. The last comment I want to make um, is um, that there's a great misconception in the entrepreneurship space, in my view, that um, you need to be the person with the innovation or the idea to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I, I don't think that's true at all. And in fact, much of the data show that only about 20% of entrepreneurs are innovators. 80% are commercializers of someone else's innovation. The most successful startup I did was a television satellite company uh, based in Europe, where my partner was a television satellite engineer. I had no idea for the first six months I was partnered with him what he was talking about most of the time when it came to the technology. Um, but eventually I, I, I caught on. But I did understand a lot of the business issues. I understood who our customers were. I understand what the pricing model was. I understood that there was a great need for private television satellite capacity for cable broadcasters in Europe. And so um, we were a partnership. So I would characterize myself as one of those 80% of entrepreneurs who's a commercializer of other people's innovation rather than having my own. And I would urge people not to beat themselves up about coming up with a cool new idea that no one's ever thought of but to be open to working with others, particularly when you come from a great university, for example. Um, I have found that universities that have very strong engineering schools um, or other STEM categories like yours, very often the people who have the innovation are exactly the wrong people to commercialize those same innovations and are looking for a, a complementary partner. So, um, you know, I would tell students, look around your classmates. Are there teams that you could or should be forming, partnerships that you could or should be forming, where the two of you do not individually have the whole, but together you do? So that would be my last uh, piece of advice. That's, uh, I think, very valuable advice, Stephen. And, and uh, the uh, your comments throughout the interview, I think are very valuable. I think it's going to be uh, 
very useful to uh, everyone who watches it. Uh, I'm very grateful to you for taking the time to do it. I, I, I want to mention before we finish uh, that people should take a look at your book. Uh, I, I think it's the argument that it makes about the importance of entrepreneurship and the uh, the role that it needs to be played to stimulate economic development to address a lot of these very difficult questions that we're facing in many in uh, some parts of the world uh, are uh, is a very very important argument and tends to often get lost when we focus maybe too much on the military side of that. So I think it's uh, this is this this is very important. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me.